Warning, if you have not watched all of Avengers Endgame and you do not want to know what happens, then skip the first 10 seconds of the 1 hour and 29 minute mark of this episode. Other than that, thank you for tuning in to Faith Unaltered and enjoy. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? I am your host, Tyler Fowler. With me is my co-host, David Russell, one of my bestest friends in the world, Joshua Davison, and our new friend, Dr. Tim Stratton. Gentlemen, what is going on? How are y'all doing tonight? Bro, it is a good day. I'm excited. <laughs> you got like so yeah. bassy right there, well, yeah, well, we, you know, it, it's funny because we're all fans of our guests, you know, and we are. Yeah. I've always I've always thought, you know, this guy has such a familiar face. And we were talking before the bro broadcast and I was like, did you do a video on uh, for, for like youth for reasonable faith and how, how apologetics change your life? And he's like, yeah, I did a couple short ones and I did one for reasonable faith. And I was like, that was it, you know, <laughs> and what, what, what he doesn't what Tim doesn't realize is that, you know, that's kind of like what inspired me to incorporate apologetics and youth ministry when I was doing the youth wow. ministry. And it's so cool uh, that, you know, apologetics does change your life. And, and so yeah. we're kind of fanboy yeah. in here. We got one of our favorite uh, apologists here. So Dr. Stratton, again, a warm welcome and thanks for being on with us. Uh, I am just honored to be here with you guys. Uh, again, before the show, we were talking about how there's not, you know, most apologists don't have huge circles. It's not like we're, you know, Hollywood celebrities or anything like that. So <laughs> we all have little circles of influence. And so we need a whole bunch of good apologists out there. And then we need to band together uh, because we're, we're, we're in this thing together and, uh, and, and we definitely need each other. And so I've got, you know, I've got a relatively small circle. You guys, you guys, I don't, you guys might have a huge circle. I'm not sure, but I'm just, we need all of our circles together. We need Working to overlap and, and join forces. So I'm just honored right. uh, to be joining forces with you guys uh, in this video. We are absolutely honored to have you. So we tried to do, so for those who, who kind of caught the first little bit that we did, so we actually did a live stream uh, and we was having so many technical difficulties, but I'm glad we've got Dr. Stratton back uh to to actually sit down and have a conversation about molinism so it's funny i was going to do an intro i wanted to do an intro to molinism and then i went to youtube and i just typed in molinism you know tim stratton and there's like 50 million different intros i don't know how many podcasts you've been on brother but there was like a whole bunch of intros and i'm just like all right 
let's go deeper into Molinism. And so we have sent him a list of about 20 questions, and I, I just kind of want to go through them. We've invited Josh uh, to join us this time. He did not, uh, he wasn't on the first one, and so I'm kind of glad it worked out the way it did so I could have him on. If For those who don't know, Josh is the one that really got me uh, into Molinism and started talking with me. He's really one of the first people to really talk to me about Molinism and this concept. And so I'm excited to have him. Um, I know he's going to bring a lot to the table, but let's just dive into it. And so with really without further ado, Dr. Stratton, for those who don't know, don't know you, uh, will you give us just a brief introduction, a little testimony about yourself and what was it that really got you started on the whole Molinism concept? Well, um, yeah, so my, just quickly, my testimony, um, I was three years old right before my fourth birthday. So basically almost four and my great grandpa just died and I didn't know anything about death at that point in my life. <laughs> and my mom tried to explain, she was using my action figures, uh, to try to tell the story of what happens in eternity It was actually weeble wobbles. Um, <laughs> that she was, oh, using. Wow. um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah. They're like these little egg shaped things and they were, you know, the, the commercials were, I can't like they, they fall, but they don't stay down. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. And, yep. uh, and this one was kind of uh, broken. And so it had this, uh, little clear plastic covering on the, on the action figure. Uh, on the weeble wobble and you could slide it on and off and my mom tried to explain the soul to me at that age and and slid it off of the um the weeble wobble and then put it up on top of a a, a shelf that i couldn't see uh see up on and and she said that this is what happens when we die if we have jesus in our hearts and she goes this is where your great grandpa is he's up in in heaven with jesus and it's beautiful up there it's perfect and it's so much fun and she just did a great job of explaining heaven that she didn't you know she didn't say oh we get to sit on the clouds and play harps or anything like that no she described this awesome fun place to be with jesus and our friends and family and it goes on forever and ever and i was like okay i want that and she said well you got to ask jesus into your heart and so I did that and I, you know, in my head at the time, that was, you know, a little action figure, actually, you know, action figure, Jesus living inside my heart. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. But, uh, you know, I prayed, I remember praying at three years old and, uh, one of the first memories of my life. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I believe I was sincere and I thank God honored that. And, uh, just has continued to work on my life. I went through a time where I fell away. Uh, I mean, I always believed Christianity was true. Uh, but where I wasn't living it, it was kind of lukewarm for a while. But then I went to a DC talk concert, probably around age 20 and, uh, heard the song called Jesus freak. And I just was convicted. I was like, all right, that's it. I got to be devoted to Christ, devoted to Jesus 24 seven. I don't care what anybody else thinks about me. I'm devoting not just my life to Christ, but to, to, to telling people about Jesus wherever I'm at. And so yeah, it's, uh, I, you know, I was born again at a young age, but devoted my life to f actually following Christ seriously at probably around age 20 at a DC talk concert. So anyway, one thing led to another. I got into youth ministry and in youth ministry realized, wow, the kids are dropping off like flies. <laughs> you know, they're becoming atheists right in front of my face. Yep. This is that video that you saw, David. I was talking about this experience where this young man became an atheist, a young man who was, who's been in my, uh, my Bible study for two years, been in my youth group for a couple of years, raised in the church in an awesome Christian family. And then because I kind of answer some of his questions, became an atheist right in front of my face and, and his objections that he brought were actually, I mean, they seemed good to me at the time and it really rocked my faith. Uh, I didn't lose my faith, but I, but, but he rocked me. And, uh, I was wondering, man, do we have answers to these objections? And so mm. I started doing some searching on the internet and ran into guys like William Lane Craig and JP Moreland and Mike Lacona and the, you know, just so many others. Uh, and I just started tearing up 
um, all of their work and especially uh, William Lane Craig's uh, Reasonable Faith podcast. I would listen to one of those <laughs> at least one every day. And then pretty soon I found out about Biola and I was like, I got to go there to learn from Craig and Moreland and all these other greats there and went there and, you know, it's just been one thing after another. Uh, just it does change your life, uh, you know, understanding not just what we should believe, but why we believe it. And then the whole systematic approach to theology too has also really helped me trying to make sure that all of my theological beliefs are coherent and fit mm -hmm. together. And if they don't do that, if they're contradicting each other, I'm like, I, I realize, okay, at least one of these has to go. And mm -hmm. so that's really, uh, you know, that's been the, the catalyst to help me really dig deep into all these different theological issues. Some of which we're going to talk about today. And that's what really led me to, um, eventually become a Molinist. I saw that there was apologetic um, significance to Molinism, but most importantly, I just saw how it made sense of all of Scripture and how a systematic approach to theology, uh, you know, if one is committed to systematic theology, which I think everybody should be, I think that Molinism is the only way uh, to make sense of all of Scripture um, and uh uh, also defeat problems of evil and uh, other things like that. So, yeah, I knew some guys, they were always like, yeah, you don't throw, don't throw that Mullinous defeater when we're talking about evil at me, you know, and cause yeah. it's, it is like, it's like the <laughs> defeater, you know, mm -hmm. like ends the conversation right there. But, um, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you know, it was it really attracted me to Mullinism because, you know, I, I never, I never, like I, I tell the guys all the time, I don't claim a, a specific position here. Um, I lean Molinist and mm -hmm. Arminian, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah, so it's the only one. The reason that I was attracted to it is because it's the only one that dives it into the depths of omniscience, right? Like how do how do we figure out omniscience? And I and I'm not sure if we'll ever truly figure that out as finite creatures. You know what I mean? But <laughs> but that's a tough one. I think it. I think that Molinism does dive into that aspect instead of saying, oh, it's this way or, oh, it's that way. And it has to be that way. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think it's a lot deeper than what you think, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, talking about God here and God's pretty wild in the first place. Now I'm not appealing to mystery here, but right. you know, I'm, I am saying that, you know, um, Molinism is the best one for me. It was the most attractive to me because it dives into that aspect trying to explain you know, it you know? yeah i think i think you're accurate whenever you say that because i'm i'm trying to think if you know calvinism or really even arminianism in the sense and i know we're going to get into why molinism isn't really necessarily a soteriological concept right but i can't think of any other system that really dives into omniscience if i'm really trying to think about it uh josh do you know of any because um i mean they're I they're I don't know about a deep dive into omniscience specifically, but I've heard a lot of uh, really interesting talk out of dynamic omniscience, this open theism thing. Um, right. They go pretty, they're, they're pretty, um, let's say thorough. Um, I don't know that their answers are as convincing as some of the things that I've heard out of Molinism, but uh, they, they seem to have a pretty robust view of things, um, but they're looking at it from a different perspective. And so it's not exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah we the, should get the, uh, Duffy on a Molinist to debate. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got okay. one. I got one on uh, a Pora. If you ever want to, I got one on standby, bro. <laughs> yeah. Slap that no, I, boy I think, up. I think the open theist uh, does take a strong position on God's omniscience, and mm -hmm. it is uh, much different than um, the the Molinist version. And I think most how most Calvinists would uh, would describe God's omniscience is simply that. God is necessarily omniscient. That's the Molinist and most Calvinists would say that God is necessarily omniscient. And there's no, that means there's no circumstance God can be in in which he does not know the truth value to any proposition, any and all propositions. So if he's necessarily mm -hmm. omniscient, he cannot fail to know everything, uh, to know the truth value to all propositions in any circumstance. And that includes the cir circumstance prior to his creative decree. And so if that's true, then uh, the middle, not God has to have middle knowledge. Now, the 
uh, open theist is going to say, well, God knows everything that's logically possible to know. And, um, and that doesn't include knowing everything prior to his decree. Now, I think that it's going to run, uh, that the open theist is going to run into scriptural uh, issues. Um, and I think problem of evil issues, which I think a lot of open theists or a lot of people are attracted to, attracted to open theism because they think it helps get God off of problem of evil hooks. I think there's more uh, <laughs> traps that can be set for the open uh, theists. Huh? Um, and uh, I think Molinism is by far the best way to get out, out of those traps um, and to avoid traps altogether. So uh, maybe that's a topic for another show. But that would uh, be, I would yeah. love to talk to you yeah. about that, brother. But let me, before we go too deep into Molinism, can you give us just a brief history of what, I mean, we all know that Luis de Molina, right? This is mm -hmm. who, who Molinism is coined after. What was it exactly that he was writing to? I know in the first, you know, kind of little episode that we did, uh, you were talking about he was responding to Calvin and Luther and, and, and these different guys. Can you give us just a brief history of how Molinism started? Yeah, yeah. So um, the ideas behind Molinism uh, really uh, can be traced all the way back to, you know, way before Molina lived. Um, you know, we, we've traced them back, uh, the main ideas, um, to the late uh, 300s, the AD 300s. Well, I mean, technically, I argue that they can be traced back all the way to Scripture, <laughs> the concepts behind <laughs> Molinism. We'll, we'll talk about that. But um, but really, as far as church history goes, uh, you know, it's been demonstrated that uh, Gregory of Nyssa, around in the same time of Augustine, um, was using the concepts, was uh, writing about the concepts that um, are later, uh, later labeled as Molinism in the 1600s. Um, actually somebody told me today that Augustine even had some of these ideas, but I need to verify that myself. Um, but, uh, yeah, the term Molinism is derived from a Spanish theologian, um, by Spanish, I mean, from Spain in the 1600s named Luis de Molina and his last name Molina is where we get Molinism and where we get uh, the term Molinist. So it's from Molina. But anyway, I, I argue for something called mere Molinism. I have a book on it called Human Freedom, Divine Knowledge, and Mere Molinism. People want to read about that. Got a second edition slated to come out sometime in 2023, but I encourage you to get the original. It'll be a collector's item. Um, but <laughs> Only if you sign it. I, yeah, I, I would be happy. Say that's right. Be happy to, <laughs> even if you get it on Kindle, I'll sign your Kindle. So uh, <laughs> right on the screen with a black Sharpie. Um, <laughs> but uh, no. So I argue for something called mere Molinism. And this means that as long as we affirm just two things, uh, then, then we can disagree with everything else that Molina espoused. Right. And since he was a Catholic Jesuit uh, monk, you know, a lot of Protestants would probably disagree with a lot of things he said, but I'm saying, Hey, at least he got two things, right. And if we can affirm these two things, then we can affirm what I call mere Molinism. And that's this. The first thing is that God possesses middle knowledge. And the second thing is that humans at least occasionally possess libertarian freedom. And so if those two uh, propositions are true, if we have those two ingredients, then mere Molinism is true. Now, as, as far as historical interaction, um, you know, I think, uh, well, yeah, there, there's not been a lot of debate in the past, right. you know, in these last 500 years, there hasn't been a lot of debate um, between the Molinist and the Calvinist, uh, not, not until recent years. So mm -hmm. I'll give you a, a brief history here. Let's start uh, basically 500 years ago with the Reformation. So we've got Luther, and Calvin, right? Um, and, and and then Molina counters their writing. So they all their lives all overlap. We got Luther in Germany, Calvin in France, and Molina in Spain. And they didn't have uh, cell phones or Facebook or anything like that, or, or the, the internet in general. So it was really hard for Could them. Could you imagine if they did? I think oh. we would have avoided so many of the problems we're, we're, we're dealing with today, these the theological yep. debates we're dealing with today. I always say that if they would have all been in a room together or at least had the internet and could have at least emailed each other or had a Facebook uh, private <laughs> message group or whatever, 
I think they would have got on the same page. Ye old Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <Ye> old. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. So, yeah, yeah. Now, now I'm just thinking about that. You know, we can time travel. <laughs> start the yeah, anyway i think <laughs> time travel fun. is metaphysically impossible so forget it amen um, josh and i were having an interesting conversation about how the uh it, whether or not god can actually interact in the past uh before this episode and so that that was a i don't, I don't want to get off in the weeds of that but that was a really interesting so a theory anyway. or b theory tim oh i'm a staunch a theorist i do think the molinist uh, needs to be an a theorist um, to be consistent. I, and I don't think uh, there's any libertarian freedom compatible with a block theory, a B block theory of the universe. But mm. there's some B theorists who disagree with me, so maybe I'm wrong. But I, I have written on this um, on my website. Anyway, um, let's get back to uh, yeah. the history here. Um, so you had Luther and Calvin, and then you had Molina countering their writings. And then you have uh, Equibus Arminius, um, we'll just call him Jake, right? Jake enters the scene, and uh, Jacob Arminius was a reformer who died in good standing with the reformers, right? So he, he's a good reformed theologian. And at one point, though, Arminius was accused of being, um, what Tom McCall once told me, he was accused of being too Catholic, and so simply could not risk aligning himself with Luis de Molina since Molina was a Catholic Jesuit uh, priest. So history is important here. We, we need to put ourselves in their shoes and, and understand that even the political pressures that they were under to adopt different theological views um, and, and how things are, are playing out here and, and you know, uh, wanting to be in good standing with the reformers and, and things like that. So, um Anyway, uh, many historians think that Arminius took Molina's work and attempted to, attempted to repackage it and then offer it in different words. And historians in, infer this, uh, this explanation because Molina's writings have been found in Arminius's library. And uh, they've actually found Arminius actually quoting Molina, but uh, not citing him. So I mean, today we accuse them of per or not perjury, a uh, plagiarism. Plagiarism. Mm -hmm. um, but you now put yourself in his shoes again. He's a reformer, wanting to be in good standing with the reformers, and so he can't quote a Spanish Jesuit monk. Uh, so um, this is, that's the way I understand the story. Um, so uh, so yeah, he even talks about middle knowledge in a couple places. Now, I now Kirk McGregor thinks that he didn't really understand it, um, but there's big debate there. So because of this, many believe that Arminius was actually a, a closet Molinist of sorts. Now, Kirk McGregor uh, disagrees and contends that Arminius may have really liked some, some of Molina's views, but failed to express them correctly, or that Arminius was highly influenced by Molina, yet held a different view. Now, others uh, would say that Arminius did understand Molina correctly and would consider himself to be a Molinist, but those who were attempting to popularize Arminius's teachings did not properly understand Arminius's attempts at teaching Molina's middle knowledge view. So whatever the case might be, um, it's vital to note that the Synod of Dort was not responding to the real thing. They were not responding to Molinism. So Molinism, mm -hmm. Luis de Molina was not on trial here. And that's why understanding this history is important because things start to become clear. When we realize why the church is believing things that it believes today, and then you look at the historical uh, events that led to today, um, things, you know, you can start asking um, some uh, important questions, I, I guess. Um, anyway, bottom line is it's of utmost importance to understand that the theologians at Dort did not respond to actual Molinism. So is it all right with you guys if I give a, a timeline of events? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so let's start. Again, I think history is important here. Um, so we're going to start with Luther. He lived from 1483 
1546. And then you had Calvin, who lived from 1506 to 1564. Um, so Luther in Germany, Calvin in France. And then you had Molina. He's responding to a Roman Catholic audience, and uh, he lives from 1535 to 1600. And after Molina, then you had Arminius. And you have his incorrect, maybe, um, repackaging of Molina from 1560 to 1609. Mm -hmm. And then after Arminius dies, you have his followers, the Arminians, um, publish the Remonstrance the year after Arminius dies in 1610. And then you have the Synod of Dort specifically responding to the incorrect repackaging offered by the Arminians, but not against genuine Molinism. And the Synod of Dort took place in 1618 to 1619. Mm -hmm. And I like to say that uh, from 1619 to the present day, centuries of confusion within the church. So I think if they could have all been together um, in, in the same room or at least in the same, um, you know, if, it, if they had email and could email each other, I think they would have been uh, uh, been on the same page. But uh, it didn't work out that way. So we have a lot of fun over the last 500 years of trying to uh, uh, pick up the pieces and make sense of everything. Absolutely. But, yeah, I, I guess, you know, with, with this historical backdrop in mind, mm -hmm. it's clear that the Synod of Dort um, consisted of some Calvinistic reformers responding to the followers, the Arminians, of another reformer, Arminius, who were mm -hmm. offering a caricature of a system, not the real thing, deriving from a reformer, Luis de Molina, I mean, he, uh, according, according to Kirk McGregor, right. he says that he considers Molina to be a reformer who just disagreed with Luther about leaving the church. He said, I'm going to bring reform from within. But anyway, uh, yeah, um, yeah, he was attempting to bring reform in a different manner than the majority of the reformers. So anyway, there's, there's not been a lot of interaction between the two views, uh, between Molinism and Calvinism anyway, until recent years. And I like to say that that's the case because the Reformation tsunami was so large and powerful that it, it drowned out Molina for half a mm -hmm. millennium. And so it wasn't until the 1970s that Alvin Plantinga um, found Molina and gave him some CPR, resuscitated him. <laughs> pulled <laughs> him up from Plantinga the depths. Is, is, what's that? <laughs> I said pulled him up from the depths. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And Alvin Plantinga is a self-proclaimed Reformed theologian. And he's the one, the one that resuscitated Molina and brought him back to life, as it were. Um, that's when Molina uh, first got a breath after the Reformation tsunami um, and where when Molinism began to gain strength in the 1970s. And now it's, it's gained so much strength. Uh, I believe it was Dean Zimmerman who recently stated that among Christian philosophers, Molinism is either the fastest growing or the leading view of God's sovereignty today. So. Anyway, if one wants to see these two views compared and contrasted in recent history, I recommend uh, William Lane Craig versus Paul Helm on Justin Brierley's Unbelievable show. Unbelievable, yeah. And, uh, and also Dr. Craig versus James White on the same program. That was back in November. And that discussion led to my debate with James White that took place in Houston back in February of this year. And that was a lot of fun. You can find that debate on my YouTube channel. Uh, my YouTube channel is called Free Thinking Ministries. Um, but that was my first debate. So I was really nervous because uh, James <laughs> White has had like 300 debates over the last 30 years. Um, Great job, by the way. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. I, you know, I was nervous. I made some rookie mistakes, but I still think I won. Um, but I'm biased. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I encourage people to watch my opening speech and then and then tell me yeah. if my arguments in the opening speech were ever refuted. And no, they were not. So. If I made the case uh, supporting the the resolution of the debate and my case is never refuted, then it's hard for me to see uh, how I lost. But I'll let right. people be the judge. So I think it's really, really important to understand the history because I know I've seen some of Dr. White, even in the debate, I believe, uh, with you and then independent videos of his own, you know, just really 
bash on the fact that Molina was this Jesuit who is just trying to destroy the Reformation, mm-hmm. right? I think it's super important not to get your info, and I'm not saying that he's doing this or anything like that, but just if you're interested in the subject, go read what Molina himself wrote, or if you can't, read what the things people like Kurt McGregor have, you know, read and written about him because it's important to understand what exactly Molina was saying was talking about and not just hear the word Jesuit and say oh I don't want nothing to do with yeah. it yeah fair enough yeah. yeah I was also say uh yeah Tim <laughs> for somebody that watches uh debates like constantly I was wondering if you were if, if nerves were getting to you because you were you, you sounded really jumpy at times and I was like that's not that doesn't sound like Tim <laughs> right there yeah. it's like yeah, so that was, but, 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 well, you know, I mean, first debate, just, as, as, James as White, a humble, you know, yeah, like as a, a humble, like, thing. I mean, you're debating James White. I mean, <laughs> I you wouldn't props, be nervous. Bro. Anybody would be. I so, mean, I man, have done bro, it. No, no fault, bro. No fault. I, you thank you. Thank you. I, I do. I mean, I consider the two best debaters in the world, um, or at least the two most significant and experienced debaters in the world mm-hmm. to be William Lane Craig and James White. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, I, I took on a heavyweight champ as a rookie and uh, and I was nervous. I didn't know exactly all the rules. I didn't, especially when it came to cross-examination, I didn't sure. really know how to do that. I learned a lot from the process. I can guarantee you if I do that debate again, uh, the cross-examination would, I do it much differently. But I tell people, go look at my opening Uh, speech Mm -hmm. my second speech and my third speech and you look at his three speeches as well and tell me who won um right on yeah so well i hope that if you ever do it again becomes a when you do it again because i really thought that that was really great and even like like granted the first time experience i wouldn't have i wouldn't have gathered that just by watching the thing Mm -hmm. um you were perhaps irritated by his his I was. Uh, let's say method but i think you did really really well man well done thank you yeah. thank you i I, I, was, I was irritated i was nervous i was a little bit starstruck also because <laughs> <laughs> i do look up to him actually and yeah. i respect him greatly i agree with him on so many things i just think he's dead wrong on this issue Right. Well, you stated actually on that debate that uh, Molinism differs from Calvinism and Arminianism in that Molinism is not really a soteriological concept, right? So what? let me ask you this. What would you classify Molinism under, if you could categorize it, what would that category be? Uh, it's Yeah, it's definitely not a soteriological view. However, mm-hmm. it can be applied to soteriological issues. Um, right. So that's where it gets confusing and and uh, people wind up uh, classifying it as a soteriological model, but it's not. So I guess I'd classify it this way. Uh, Molinism is a model demonstrating how God can be sovereign over and predestine all things and how humans can possess libertarian freedom and be Everything. responsible in a dessert sense for some things, right? So God's predestined so, everything. That, I believe, that's your view. yes. Okay. I, that's my view. And, okay. and, and my view or not, uh, Molinism is a model showing how God can be sovereign over and predestined all things and how humans okay. can possess libertarian freedom and be responsible in a dessert sense for some things. And so it's that, that all versus the sum is important here. Okay, let me ask you this, Tim, real quick, and then David and Josh, I want you guys to jump in as well. So whenever, because a Calvinist, right, will say, well, God predestines all things. So what exactly is the difference between you and a Calvinist whenever you both say God predestines all things? Um, So we both agree that God predestines all things. We disagree on the how God predestines all things. So the Calvinist is going to say God predestines all things by making it happen. Uh, uh, through deterministic means. Um, I, I say it's causal determinism. So determinism, um, and, and this is how many of the, the Calvinists define it, um, is, is, uh, determinism would be defined along these lines that um, the antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate all events, um, or that would it would be all effects, right? So if they are 
causally or if they're if they're connected to those antecedent conditions right um so if they're going to focus on these antecedent um conditions uh then if they can if these antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate the the event then i say well that's causal determinism and you're seeing a lot of calvinists or at least some calvinists today um kind of retreat from the word causal and I, i i find that interesting um i don't think they can um, but anyway, I, I like to say it like this, the antecedent conditions are either sufficient or insufficient to necessitate all events. And, uh, so the Calvinist says that God predestines everything. Amen to that. I agree. And they say that he does that via determinism. And the Molinist says, well, God does predestine everything. Um, but he does not have to, uh, determine everything, um, to predestine it. And the Molinists can demonstrate this, uh, that God can predestine all things. If a God is omnipotent and omniscient prior to creation, then he can predestine all things, even the things that aren't uh, determined to occur. Uh, he can predestine even uh, libertarian free human choices. Right? And so if they're libertarian free humans, then they are not determined by definition. So anyway, we, we, we both, the Calvinists and the Molinists both agree on predestination. We disagree on the how. So in one sense, it's really kind of okay. a silly disagreement. We're all agreeing on predestination, but we disagree right. in, in the how it occurs. And I think it's important. I mean, this is such a big issue that we're, we're willing to, uh, I mean, I, in a sense, divide over it. Not that we can't go share the gospel together and stuff, but yeah, it, it really, uh, I think a big part of it gets into the problem of evil. I don't think the Calvinists can um, escape the objections uh, raised um, by because the, what it uh, seems. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, finish your thought. No, no, you go. I was just going to say because it seems like what what I'm hearing, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, is that whenever it comes to predestination from the Calvinist perspective, that God is, and I'm just going to use this terminology because I can't think of anything better, but more hands on. But whenever you're describing it, Tim, it sounds like not passive. That's not the word, but I guess more hands off in the sense. So yeah. does that make sense? Josh, mm-hmm. you want to add to, is there anything that you guys want to add to that? Josh, David? Um, I, I was going to say, I think the only, the only difference I think, well, not only di- the main distinction, I think between the Calvinistic idea of predestination and what, uh, what Tim is describing so far is the logical priority of omniscience and decree. God's omniscience okay. comes before the decree in in the Molinist view, and God's omniscience, or at least knowledge of all things that will be, is uh, uh, contingent upon having decreed all things. And so as far as I can tell, that seems okay. to be the main distinction. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, I think you're right, uh, Josh, and, and the but the problem is, and I pointed this out to White in our debate, is if if White's going to say, or if a Calvinist is going to say that God does not have middle knowledge prior to the decree, then there's a circumstance in which God doesn't know the truth value to all propositions, and therefore God mm. is not necessarily omniscient. So not that's what that I said. Point that. anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, so necessary omniscience means there's no circumstance. Right. God cannot fail to know everything in any yeah. circumstance if right. God is necessarily omniscient. Now, most Calvinists will want to affirm God's necessary omniscience. And right. I pointed out, well, on White's view, he's saying, I mean, really, on this view, White has to affirm open theism, um, at least prior ah. to the decree. God doesn't know everything. Strange bed prior follows, to the right? What's that? <laughs> Strange, Strange bedfellows, bedfellows. Just the right. <laughs> direction. <laughs> and I think, <clears throat> I think James White uh, has a greater revulsion against open theism than he does Molinism. I don't, I don't know, but I know he he's not a fan. But yeah. on his weird <laughs> view, he's uh, since he he's so opposed to this idea of middle knowledge, <laughs> and that just follows. And I explained this in the debate: if God is necessarily omnipotent and necessarily omniscient then middle knowledge comes along for the ride. Can't He can't help it, but to have it. <laughs> so, it has right. to, it seems like, because so, if the middle knowledge is dependent on, or contingent on God's decree, then how could it logically exist prior to the decree being actualized? Right. Right. 
Right. And uh, I think I think all of us and, you know, I'm sure Dr. Stratton, you probably agree with this. We all had our oh crap moment when we actually figured out Molinism. Right. Because it's <laughs> it's not the easiest concept yeah. <laughs> to uh, grasp. And I think one of the real big things that helped me as it kind of relates to this is Craig's uh, answer on the 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 unfallible barometer. Right. Yeah. I think that really helped me. So when, you know, if you guys ever it, for the audience, if you want a simple way to kind of get into it, kind of listen to Craig's analogy of the unfallible mm -hmm. barometer, which you can pick up on defenders. Cause that was where yeah. I started, Tim. I, I didn't start with reasonable faith. The, the podcast talk about it in here too, I think. Oh, do you? For yeah. Sure. I started with defenders when nice. it came to Craig, I just mm -hmm. launched right in and I had, yeah. to, I remember I had to like write down like, words you know that i didn't even know oh existed. yeah join the club <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. so yeah, yeah anyways but yeah that's that's what really helped me and <clears throat> yes yes you do have a section on that in your book so that's, that's yeah. really cool yeah. i thought i did what? but i couldn't remember <laughs> um, tim i got a question for you so let yeah. me ask you this do you so whenever it comes to causal determinism do you believe that there's anything that god causally determines oh yeah i think god causally determines uh, a whole bunch of things, um, okay. if not if not most things. So uh, okay. I, I just say that on occasion, a uh, human um, makes choices that are not causally determined by God or something else, that we are the source of that choice or that judgment um, or, you know, or deliberation. Um, at least occasionally okay. something or someone else does not causally determine me to think or evaluate or judge or choose or act a certain way, at least on occasion, uh, some of those things are up to me and not up to sure. God or something else. So, but yeah, I, yeah. I mean, anybody who, anybody who advances the Kalam cosmological argument would have to say that God causally determines some things. It's all about uh, cause and effect. Anybody, right. anybody who advances the, the fine tuning argument um, is going to say that God causally determines the fine tuning of the initial conditions of the early universe that necessitate sure. the, then um, the events of the the galaxy and planet and solar system in which we live, the life permitting universe. Um, right. mm -hmm. So these are all things that God has determined. Um, and uh, but that doesn't mean that he cannot uh, cause and create a being in his image and likeness with the supernatural power of libertarian freedom. Um, sure. I do think that it's the supernatural power that we have, and that's what separates us from the other things in the universe. Um, sure. we, we, you know, the mere fact that we are rational agents, um, I think is because we are supernaturally endowed with the likeness of God. And that is uh -huh. what separates us from uh, the animals, the trees, the rocks, <laughs> the stars, the planets, yeah. everything else in the universe. Um, as far as I know. So, so let me take that question a step further then. And I'm curious, and, and guys, I want you to jump in on this as well. But do you believe that God causally determines sin? Um, Ever, just in any certain, and, and I hear what you're saying. Libertarian free will is not necessitated that we have it all the time, right? But just sometimes, is that correct? Oh, yeah, okay. So yeah, libertarian freedom does not mean that... Uh, I have to have that all the time. Like there could be right. instances. Sorry, I threw where, two questions at you at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm just, uh, it's what I call in my book, limited libertarian freedom. Um, mm -hmm. just sometimes, um, uh, yep. at least when I'm making moral or rational decisions, those have to be free in a libertarian sense. But there's also times maybe when I order from a menu at a restaurant, maybe I don't have free will there. Um, or at least libertarian freedom. Uh, gotcha. you know, I'm not, I'm not, conceding that i'm just saying maybe i could see that maybe uh my taste buds determine my greatest desires of tacos at that moment that's and right. so i you know so that's determined every time the could, wife asks you where do you want to eat baby it's like hmm where do i want to eat yeah. you know <laughs> right so. yeah but uh, what i'm interested in is dessert responsibility um being praised or blamed uh mm -hmm. you know this epistemic responsibility um, when it comes to thinking things through and making a rational decision or making a, a, a moral decision, um, this is dessert responsibility. Dessert means uh, deservings, 
do I deserve praise or blame? Whenever I order a taco at the restaurant, I, I don't deserve praise or blame for that. Um, but if, uh, if I'm, if I've, if I make a, so I think responsibility and, uh, we, we look at things like um, morality. Uh, mm -hmm. When I when I make a wrong, you know, let, let's talk about oughts and shoulds, right? Yeah. These pertain to at least three things: um, morality, rationality, and aesthetics. So mm -hmm. when I don't choose as I ought to, when it comes to a moral decision, I've done something immoral or sinful or evil. Right? right. I've missed the moral mark. Right. Mm -hmm. When I don't choose as I ought to when I'm deliberating. Um, I've, I've not, I've missed the mark of rationality and therefore I've become irrational. I've done something irrational. Uh, I've, I've not, I haven't thought the way I should have or ought to have. And when I create something, um, aesthetically that misses the mark, um, I've created something ugly or at least not as beautiful as it could have been if I followed the rules of aesthetics, you know, so there's, there's these, right. uh, these oughts that I'm concerned with. Um, and, uh, and if something or someone else causally determines the way I think, the way I judge, um, the mm -hmm. way I deliberate, it's not really me that's doing it. It's up to something or somebody else. If it's God that's doing it, then when I sin, well, God causally determined my greatest desire which in turn causally determined my sinful thought, which in turn causally determined my sinful action. Um, and now apply that to Hitler or the KKK or right. the rapist or whatever, you know, the, the Calvinist who cheats on his wife. Now, now I mean, that's it, God. We're going to, we're left saying that God determined the Christian, the Calvinist to cheat on his yeah. wife. Yeah. You know, he, he was a passive cog. So anyway, you asked, do I believe that God ever causally determines men and women to sin? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, okay. However, okay, so as it says in Acts 4, God does predestine. You're so good, sin. bro. <laughs> I love it. That, God, that's exactly where I was going to go. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, God predestines human sin. Yep. God created a world, on, on the Molinist view, God created a world yep. in which he knew that humans would freely do what they ought not to do, right? Mm -hmm. So sin, by definition, is missing the mark. So mm -hmm. suppose that God causally determines a Calvinist to think adulterous thoughts, um, or, or even actually causally determines, like I said, the Calvinist to cheat on his wife. If that's the case, then the Calvinist ought to do exactly what God determines him to do. Now think about it. If you could do other than what God was determining you to do, then somehow you become more powerful than God. So for the Calvinist to do anything other than not cheat on his wife in this circumstance would be to miss the mark. And that would be a sin. So clearly right. everyone should see how absurd this is. So therefore right. we ought not believe that God causally determines a person to sin. Uh, we, that, we need libertarian freedom here. That's what Josh, I mean, I've had this conversation with Josh, you know, so many times like just exactly uh, what what you just said. And it's so interesting to really, whenever you sit back and think about it, that is the conclusion that you come to, right? Mm -hmm. it, you you can't. It, it, if, if God, so let's just take just whatever, for example. So, so I, wanna, I wanna do this, I, I wanna hear, I wanna agree with you, and then I wanna play devil's advocate for just a second. But <laughs> at the same time, so let's just say, you know, God causes uh, adultery, right? If you do what God is causing, causally determining you to do, then there is no sin. There mm -hmm. is no missing the mark. You are right. obeying exactly to the T, yeah. even though, you know, God says, don't do this over here. So now to play devil's advocate, though, whenever it comes, because I think we all would agree, adultery is horrible, right? Murder is horrible, but especially the murder of the son of God. That is the most detrimental, I think, most evil, sinful act there ever could have been, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if that wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't have been saved. But that's another topic. But the point is, I think, and, it, and, it, and I think, Tim, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, 
But this boils down to what does that term predestination mean in Acts 4? Yes, God pre or predestinate. Let me, uh, I got it right here. For, so the, the uh, passage is Acts 4, 27. For indeed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together in this city, your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do as much as, as your power and your plan had decided beforehand uh, would happen. And now, Lord, pay attention to their threats and grant to your servants to speak your message with great cor- courage while you extend your hand to heal. And so that's kind of, that's that's really the um, the qualm, right? Is what does that word mean as, as the NET uh, translates it, decided beforehand? Am yeah, I right? Which- which other, which also means predestined, right? Right, right. So, so yeah, there's two ways of understanding that, as far as I can mm-hmm. tell. Um, either God decided beforehand that that's what's going to happen, and so He causally determined it to happen exactly as it happened. Mm-hmm. And so then every sinful act was ultimately also determined by God, either through primary or secondary causation. Um, so. So that's what the Calvinist says. And the Molinist says, well, hold on a second. God can predestine what they freely chose to do, right? And the, the causal chain was broke or it was broken. They were free to do it. God just knew they would. If he, uh, God knew what they would do if he created this world. Mm-hmm. He knew what they would freely do in a libertarian sense if he created this world and he created this world. He decided beforehand um, to create this world knowing how they would freely choose. And so... Um, right. on, on the Molinist view, God did not determine their sin. Therefore, their sin was up to them. They were the source of their sin, and therefore, um, they are also worthy of blame and of judgment for their sin. Because but gosh, they're the source. They're the source. But if God determined them to do it, I don't see how they're worthy of blame. Uh, they did exactly what they were supposed to. Um, exactly mm-hmm. what God made them do. They're, they so. obeyed perfectly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another, another, another thing that I kind of like bring up, and and I know it's not like it's not a lockstep argument, but uh, you know, when the disciples preached this, when Peter preached this uh, sermon, uh, the gospel had already occurred. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I mean, Jesus went through his temptations where he had the opportunity to uh, circumvent the cross and and you, you know. Uh, take all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, that stuff was presented to him, you know, so all that's in mind when he's preaching that, that sermon. So we've got to think about, okay, historically, yeah, Jesus, uh, Jesus had his opportunities here uh, and had his, his, uh, you know, he went through the temptations. He went through everything that we went through and he chose the plan of God, you know, mm-hmm. and God knew that. You know, God would know that, you know, and so, I mean, you you could see where Molinism can work in that, you know, just from my perspective. Yeah, Yeah. I definitely see. So I'm glad you guys are breaking it down like that, because I can definitely see what you mean now whenever you interpret these passages. And that's what this whole concept really boils down to. Are you interpreting these passages like a Calvinist or like a Molinist? Because we mm-hmm. all bring these things to the table whenever we're reading the Bible. I mean, just in my opinion, but yeah. kind of like the old earth thing. But anyway, that's that's beside the point. But no, um, so I'll, let me ask you this, Tim. What does libertarian free will look like before the fall? And then what does libertarian free will look like after? Yeah, okay, so um, libertarian freedom is simply uh, the ability to choose such that mm-hmm. antecedent conditions are insufficient to causally determine or necessitate one's choice. Okay. So let me say that again. Libertarian freedom, this is how I define it. It's the ability to choose such that antecedent conditions are insufficient to causally determine or necessitate one's choice. Now, I've also described it this way when it comes to rationality. Um, The ability to think such that antecedent conditions are insufficient to causally determine or necessitate one's thoughts and ensuing beliefs. So, as I said in my debate with White, these definitions of libertarian freedom hold whether or not there are alternative possibilities available to the chooser or to the thinker. 
So that is to say, strictly speaking, based upon the definition I've offered, in a strict sense, libertarian freedom does not require alternative possibilities. However, if one does possess opportunities to choose among alternative possibilities in the real world at a specific time and place, then it's necessarily the case that one is not determined by something or someone else. So uh, with biblical data in mind, um, we can understand libertarian freedom like this, and it's the opportunity to exercise an ability to choose between at least two options, each of which is compatible with one's nature in a circumstance where the prior antecedent conditions are insufficient to causally determine or necessitate the agent's choice. And that's a fancy way of saying uh, the ability to do otherwise. So, right. um, so your question was about what libertarian free will looks like before and after the fall. Um, it, uh, I mean, in a sense, it doesn't look any different. And that's just the sense that as long as um, the, you know, pre-fall Adam and, uh, and you and I, um, or anybody else, uh, we each have the opportunity or yeah, we each have the ability to choose such, mm -hmm. at least sometimes that antecedent conditions are ins insufficient to causally determine or necessitate our choice. Um, and on some occasions we have at least two options from which to choose, uh, that are not necessitated by antecedent conditions. Um, so in that sense, libertarian freedom doesn't look any different where it does look different is what alternative choices <laughs> are available uh to choose so okay yeah the uh, pre-fall adam um had the he was in god's presence created in god's presence and had the ability uh to be <laughs> to become a sinner right now uh and so he had the opportunity to uh, to fall or to, or not, he had, you know, to eat the fruit or not. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now sinners, let's just look at the regenerate sinner. They might uh, not have the opportunity to choose to love God left to their own devices, but that doesn't mean they don't ever have the opportunity to choose between at least two choice options that are each compatible with their nature at a certain time and place in which the antecedent conditions are insufficient to determine their choice. So they can, they can rob the bank or rob the liquor store or sit mm -hmm. on the couch and think about it um, and, and have sinful thoughts without committing the actions. I mean, they're all, those are all sinful things, all sinful choice options, but that doesn't mean they don't have libertarian freedom. It does mean, however, that they don't have the ability to choose good things. Um, or at least good things related to salvation matter, matters. Um, mm -hmm. So we can all, then we could say it like this, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, when a Christian yeah. is tempted to sin, they have uh, a range of options that non-Christians might not have. Um, mm -hmm. So the Christian, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, can either choose to fall into temptation and sin or choose to take the way of escape that God provide. So Christians possess a different range of options, um, each compatible with their nature. A Christian can sin. I mean, I hardly ever sin, but you know, I still sin. A little <laughs> bit. Uh, I sin way more than I want to, but uh, you know, uh, I'm constantly being sanctified. But I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know any serious theologian um, who would say they never sin anymore. So obviously Christians still sin. Um, and, uh, but we also know that every time we're tempted to sin, God provides us a way of escape so that we don't have to. So what follows there? Every time we do sin, we could have done otherwise. God gave us a way of escape that we failed to take. It was our fault. Yeah. We're responsible. We ought to be blamed. Um, so for the Calvinist who cheats on his wife, uh, don't say that the devil made me do it. And don't say that God made you do it. No, take responsibility. You did it. It was up to you. You weren't determined to do it. You could have done otherwise. And you failed. And so mm -hmm. take responsibility and, uh, and learn from it. Um, Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, no, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I yeah. believe you did. Um, and it's like, you know, we were talking about off air, um, uh, you know, last week about how 
I, I had said it, and, and I love how you would worded it after, but I had said that Christians are more free, you know, maybe than unbelievers. And you said that there were more options available yeah. maybe to the Christian uh, mm-hmm. than to the unbeliever. And I, I, I just love the way that you worded that. I want to get into that here in a little bit. But Josh, David, you guys have been really quiet, guys. Um, y'all want to take the floor for a second? Yeah, you know, that's that's fine. Um, I was hoping because I know we're already an hour and 12 minutes. We're going to have to probably pull a part two on this. <laughs> that's fine. I'm cool with that. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Let us so, be like your weekly guest. You, ah. you could you could be our weekly guest. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. Oh man. Good, good thinkers all around there. Uh, Tuesdays with so, Tim. There you go. Yeah, Tuesday. There you go. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh I want to get into a little bit about the objections of to Molinism, right? right? And uh this has to do uh with our number seven question, obviously. Uh if you could break down uh, um, the grounding objection, this is the biggest one that people struggle with is the grounding objection. So I'll let you take uh, the the floor there with that. One. I'm so glad right. you brought this up, bro. <laughs> I'm so glad. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I actually don't think it's the biggest issue at, at all. Um, I think uh, I'll explain that, but this has been a big issue. Um <laughs> Uh, the, the grounding objection, uh, I've never felt its force. Um, and it, I think it seems to be losing favor. Um, and yeah, so I've never felt the force of this objection. And it seems that more and more non molinists are beginning to admit that it, it's not forceful as well. So uh, I'm thinking of Philip Swenson, for example. He's a non molinist who's personally told me that he thinks the grounding objection is a horrible reason to reject molinism. Um, in fact, I've recently is he a Calvinist heard, or? no, he's a simple foreknowledge guy. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I've heard, uh, recently Guillaume Bignon, um, and, uh, and Colton Carlson, uh, two mm-hmm. committed Calvinists, uh, they mm-hmm. kind of dismiss the grounding objection and say, you know, it's not that good. It's not, uh, it's, uh, it's not convincing. It's not forceful, uh, things like that. Yeah. So I'm happy to see that. Um, because I, I agree with them there. We, we disagree on a lot of things, but I'm like, this, I, I just don't feel it's forced. Now, James White, however, he seems to want to put all of his eggs in the grounding objection basket. And mm-hmm. he constantly asks, from whence does it come? You know, talking about God's middle knowledge. Um, <laughs> yeah. he, he likes to speak. Is that old English? Or, I don't know. From, from whence? <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's close to Elizabethan, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but as, as I explained to White in our debate, um, he's asking the wrong question. So the proper question to ask is what yeah. does an omniscient God know? Mm-hmm. Right? That's the question. What does an omniscient God know? Uh, and the answer is everything. God, if, if, you know, the God knows the truth value to all propositions. So I've said right. it many times. Um, I said it to white on Twitter. <laughs> I said it to white in our debate and I've written it elsewhere. If perfect power and perfect knowledge are necessary attributes of a necessary God, then middle knowledge comes along for the ride. Now, let me say that again. If perfect power, God's omnipotence, and perfect knowledge, God's omniscience, are necessary attributes of a necessary God, then middle knowledge comes along for the ride. God can't help it. Right? He's got to have it. If God is necessarily perfect in power and knowledge in all circumstances, then God has middle knowledge. And this is because God's decree is contingent and not necessary. So let you got to right. grasp that. What is necessary about God? His omni properties. Is the decree necessary? Uh, most theologians are going to say, heck no. The God decree did is not- contingent. What you mean by that, though, is God did not have to create. Right. Right. It was God's free choice. God has libertarian freedom. He was not causally determined by something or someone else to create. And he could have created differently. Not even mental knowledge. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right, right. Yeah, knowledge does not stand in causal relation. Um, So God's decree is contingent and not necessary. However, God's attributes are necessary. And this is... uh, yeah, let me. Uh, I got a note here from Alvin Plantinga. Yeah, and and he says it seems to me 
much clearer that some counterfactuals of freedom are at least possibly true than that the truth of propositions must in general be grounded in this way, right? As, as the grounding objector presupposes. So all grounding objectors are, are proposing a theory that seems far less clear um, than that there are at least some possibly true counterfactuals of freedom. And this is why, again, I've never felt the force of the grounding objection. So asking where does middle knowledge come from is like asking where does God come from? It's a confused <laughs> question, right? To put it simply, God's middle knowledge comes from his perfect nature. The fact that God is a maximally great being and exists necessarily as a maximally great being. So uh, now to exist necessarily means that God cannot fail to exist in any circumstance. And there's no possible world in which God fails to exist. And moreover, right. not only does God exist necessarily, but God possesses his perfect nature necessarily. So that means that God cannot fail to exist or exist as the perfect standard of power and knowledge in all or any circumstance. But if God is the perfect standard of power and knowledge, uh, yeah, if God is the perfect standard uh, of power and knowledge, then this means that God is the perfect standard of power and knowledge in all circumstances. And this includes the circumstance or state of affairs prior to the foundation of the world, right? Prior to God's creative decree. But here's mm -hmm. the kicker. If God is the perfect standard of power, then God possesses the power to create the kind of libertarian free creatures described in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And if God is the perfect standard of knowledge, then God knows how these free creatures would freely choose if he were to create them and even if he never does. And this is exactly what is meant by middle knowledge. So mm -hmm. did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> cool. absolutely absolutely cool. um so, josh uh, i'll let you uh go next bud um I, I mean that that was that was really thorough and i i that was basically what i meant when i was talking about the logical priority of mm -hmm. of in calvinism the decree seems to be something contingent upon god decreeing and then his omniscience is like let's say a byproduct of having decreed mm -hmm. uh whereas in in what you're describing the omniscience always comes first it's on the house so to speak mm -hmm. and when when tyler and i were right. discussing these things earlier uh and he mm -hmm. mentioned the grounding objection thing i was like it's kind of similar to asking who taught god how to be holy it doesn't really make <laughs> sense as a question That's it doesn't right. really land anywhere Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, the way that you explained that really like that almost closed some of the gap for me too, but I really, um, I think, I think that the way that some people fixate on that is just either a misapprehension or, or willfully ignoring the point because mm -hmm. really like, I, I don't know how you get around the idea that God is either omniscient or has to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, and if he learns, He's in a process of becoming mm -hmm. omniscient, right. let's say. Whereas if God yep. is omniscient by the very nature of his being, then the decree has to be something that comes after that. Like it can't right. come before that. It doesn't even make mm -hmm. sense to say so. Not, not that we're talking right. about like temporal, you know, like God doing something over time to make a decree happen. I don't think we're talking about that. But, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, in, in general, looking at the looking at the problem, let's say, of saying why is it true why is it true there's no creation for it to be true about right it's like no the proposition is true because god is infallibly correct he's omniscient that's like that's right. the foundation of the claim yeah. right. that god knows right yeah. <laughs> See, so and that's, i, I, you I know. think the way that you explained that was yep. really suitable yeah yeah and, and that's you one know of the things he, oh go ahead well as, that's one of the things like as as a calvinist that I did not, I, I didn't understand how Dr. White like didn't grasp that. And I don't mean any disrespect or anything whenever I say that, but why does it, why do these truth prop, propositions, truth values have to come from outside of God? If God is omniscient, then right. they have to come from within him. Mm -hmm. And and that's what it means. Like you said, Josh, you broke it down. So, so like kindergarten style, it's like, because what? Where does middle knowledge? It comes from God. It, it's part of his omniscience if we right. can word it like that. Yeah. David, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, and, and you know, I, I, I love the way you explained it too. Uh, 
and I was I was about to say, am I going to have to get him to just give a simple definition of the grounding <laughs> objection? But the way you came back at it was just uh, it was really good. And I think that, yeah. you know, it's exactly what the audience needs to hear, because I think yeah. we have to at least cover that in any type of Molinus conversation. I've read Craig's papers on it and stuff like that. And, yeah. it, you know. I'm settled on it, but we have mm -hmm. to cover it. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I've got a little section in here too. If people want to read it. Um, I think it does a, a good job of going through the, the problems of the, the grounding objection. So uh, wow. in a thorough, but kind of quick manner. So Before can I ask we, you a question uh, real quick, actually? Sure. Uh, and this is, this is jumping back to the, uh, the free will before and after the fall, let's say um, the the answer that you gave is basically free will is something that doesn't, it's not defined by what raw materials you have to work with. It's defined with your capacity to work with them. Right. Am I still following? Well, I've never said it like that. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm rephrasing it because like I'm coming back to what you had said and I'm trying not to rehash like everything that you had said, but it, it, it kind of stood out to me that the way that you had said it, it seems like uh, and this is this is how I would put it. Right. Is, yeah. is if you're looking at Adam prior to the fall, he had, let's say, better raw materials for his will to work with than after the fall. And it was the material that he had to work with, the, like the desires, his passions, the way that those things were inflamed. That's what changed, not his ability to choose, right? Yeah, I think that's good. Um, yeah, the <laughs> what we have to work with changes, but that doesn't mean that we never have the yeah. opportunity uh, to choose um, between at least two options or that, that, that antecedent conditions always necessitate our thoughts and beliefs and actions and behaviors and choices. So, so then it, let's say in, in terms of uh, the, the kind of like what about ism that comes out of uh, you know, like conflating this idea of, of something being in, in influence and the kind of way that some people talk about it as though influences are causes, right? Adam had a different mm -hmm. set of influences post fall, but none of those things caused him to choose any of the things that he that he chose, right? What you're yeah. saying is that as long as he's the thing doing the choosing, the mm -hmm. amount or the the kind of influences that are present don't necessarily alter the existence of libertarian freedom. Those are just the building blocks by which your will can do things in real life, right? Yeah, Joshua, I'm glad you brought up uh, th this distinction between an influence and something that uh, or, or an antecedent condition that necessitates uh, a choice right. um, or an effect uh, or an event, right? There's a difference between something that influences and something that determines. So an influence is, is not a causal determining uh, or an influence doesn't have to be a deterministic factor. Um, an influence can, uh, uh, I mean, I think we're, we're influenced. We can't help but be influenced by things but that doesn't right. mean we're causally determined by that thing they're two different things philosophically speaking is is there a point where an influence ever becomes a causal determining factor yeah or, that or would it be more an influence multiple? anymore <laughs> okay yeah, the, yeah they're categorically different things then that's at least that's how i, I think of those things and mm -hmm. how i would define these things um and uh, yeah, so an influence um, is philosophically a different thing than uh, than an antecedent condition that is sufficient to necessitate an event. Okay, so that's an what influence is doesn't necessitate, and right, an influence does not necessitate something, um, but an influence. Uh, I want to say an influence influences, but I can't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but That's yeah, a you get like, Greek. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and dying, he died. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Influencing, he influenced. Yeah, I need anyway. to. I don't have a, a an official definition of influence ready to go, but I'll I'll get one. <laughs> right on. No, I think that's important, uh, an important distinction to make too, because Josh and I were talking about that very thing, and how influence is not causally deterministic, but at the same time, so on this, uh, so on the flip side of that coin. So whenever the Spirit, the Holy Spirit who indwells us, and this is where I want to go with Romans 
uh, eight seven before we start winding down. But whenever the Holy Spirit is energizing, the Greek word is uh, energeus, right? It, to to energize us, to produce within us. And I think what is it Philippians uh, that says He is at work in us, both to will and to work according to His good pleasure, right? Does the Spirit ever become, even whenever it comes to obedience, does the Spirit ever become our, our, our transition from just an influence to an actual causal deterministic you know, factor? Or would you say, Tim, that, that, the, that the Spirit only influences us to obey? I'm not going to say the Holy Spirit never determines anything. Okay. Um, and I've never, I've never said that God in general... Um, you know, God as a Trinity or God, the father, the son, or the Holy spirit never causally determines everything. I, that, what's important to me is saying, at least on occasion, we have, if, if we're going to be deserving of praise or blame for anything, uh, then we have to have libertarian freedom. Um, if we're going to be held responsible, uh, for anything, uh, whether it be our moral decisions, our rational decisions, right? Are we, are we morally responsible? Are we epistemically responsible? Are we aesthetically mm -hmm. responsible? Um, if that is the case, in those situations, we have to have at least limited libertarian freedom. Um, but so I'm definitely not going to say that the Holy Spirit never causally determines anything. Um, so sure. I, I really have a, I don't have a much to try to prove here. Um, yeah. The determinist has a whole lot to prove. They have yeah. everything to prove. They have to prove <laughs> that God causally determines everything. everything. Um, and yeah. I don't have to do that. All I have to do is find one thing, and yeah. which it's uh, clear that we have libertarian freedom, and thus God doesn't um, causally determine everything. And I've got a, a paper um, that's about to be published, um, co-authoring it with, a, I'd say, is one of the most well-known and famous philosophers in the world today. And we're co-authoring a paper that I think is very forceful, um, showing that we have to have libertarian freedom, at least on occasion. Yeah. And that what I call exhaustive divine determinism. And so I can hear the complaints. That's redundant. I, I don't <laughs> care anymore. I don't care if it's <laughs> redundant because I have to use it because so many determinists, um, uh, kind of steal from libertarian freedom and don't realize they're doing it. So until they stop doing that, I'll, I'll be redundant just to make my point. <laughs> um, uh, exhaustive divine determinism with the emphasis on the exhaustive, the E of, of ed, E D D. Um, yeah. uh, ed exhaustive divine determinism cannot be true and it cannot be biblical. It's ultimately self-defeating. Um, mm -hmm. It ultimately destroys the reliability of scripture. It ultimately destroys the knowledge of God. It ultimately destroys epistemic responsibility. Um, it, there's so many problems with it. So that'll be coming out soon, probably in 2023. Um, but uh, yeah, I, all I got to show is that at least sometimes determinism isn't true. All I got to show is one instance of libertarian freedom to show that Ed exhaustive divine determinism is false. The determinist, the exhaustive determinist has to show that libertarian freedom never exists, that all things are determined by God all the time. So that's quite the challenge they have. Yeah. I mean, I think especially in light of first Corinthians 10, 13, I think you make an excellent argument to that, but it sounds like what you're saying is that at the same time, you know, the things that, you know, well, let me ask you this. Would you say that the things that the Holy Spirit does causally determine that we do, those things aren't play, praise or blameworthy? Like we, so, so for just for an example, if the Holy Spirit causally determined me to obey God in whatever instance, then on judgment day, I wouldn't receive a reward for that because I wasn't the one that that came from. Um, well, I think as as we noted earlier, if <laughs> if God, you know, whether the Holy Spirit or God the Father or whoever causally yeah. determines you to do anything, does it really make sense to say that I obey it? You, If God causally determines a Calvinist to cheat on his wife, mm -hmm. does it say, does it make sense to say that you obeyed him and, and you know, that, that the Calvinist obeyed God and committed adultery and cheated on his wife and destroyed his family? I mean, is that obeying God? If, if so, right. 
so I just want to parse out all these words here say, well, if yeah. God determined, if the, if the Holy Spirit determined me to do X and I obeyed him, what does that mean? That just means mm -hmm. you were determined to do X by God. I did exactly yeah. what he determined me to do. Yeah, <laughs> and you can't do otherwise. So yeah, yeah to me, I, I should you be praised every time you do what God determines you to do, including when the Calvinist cheats on his wife? I search time. I mean, should, should he be praised for that? He did exactly what God made him do. Sure. So it just doesn't make sense to me to, to think of it that way. I think we have to think of it as a, as a, as God influencing us and, and pleading with us, showing us what's right. Um, yeah. sh showing us why we should do what's right, why we should um, not resist his love and grace and let him and invite him to transform. Now I think God does, uh, once, you know, when, when we, when we do not resist his love and grace, mm -hmm. um, then he does causally determine a change in our lives, right? After we have, but, th but that, but that's, uh, you know, so, so I am a monergist and, mm -hmm. uh, I, I do say that I, um, as long as one does nothing, uh, that God will do all the work. Um, and I can get into that more if you'd like me to. But um, yeah, as, as, as when when a person stops resisting the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit causes a change in you. Um, but uh, yeah, so further questions, so, feel free. So yeah. so is that I've is the change? Oh, go ahead, David. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, like, uh, I see it as kind of like all these things, kind of like a blending, you know, uh, <laughs> like it, it's like, you know, they all happen, you know, and it, it doesn't have to not be simultaneous, you know, it doesn't, you know, it, it, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying, Tim. I think that was a really good response. Cool. Uh, go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, uh, so, so you mentioned that the, the spirit does cause, cause change within you or your person, right? And so mm -hmm. in the same sense as the fall didn't cause Adam's choices, the, the change that the spirit causes in me doesn't also cause my choices. Am I following? Whereas he's, he's like reversing the curse of the fall in my spirit so that I can commune with God, but he's not causally determining my choices because he's done something to my nature. Yeah, no. I, so I think, uh, I, I like how um, that kind of rhymed. Uh, reverse the curse. I, mean, used, to, <laughs> I used to watch a, a show when I was a little <laughs> kid called Reverse the Curse. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so yeah, so God does a change in our lives. He does uh, regenerate us, right? We can't yeah. do that on our own. I can't choose to right. be regenerated um, on my own. Uh, and, and God does that, but that is, uh, when, uh, when we, in a non-deterministic sense, stop resisting God's love and grace, um, then God begins a change in us. And that doesn't mean we lose all libertarian freedom at that point. Obviously Christians, regenerate Christians possess the ability to sin or to choose the way of escape. So, mm. um, so we still yeah. have, uh, uh, this influence, the Holy Spirit still influences us. I, I was, let's think about influence this way. Here, you know, when, when we're tempted to sin, this influence, here is the way of escape. You can do it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to determine you to do it, but here it is. Talk about an influence, right? Um, <laughs> but it's, it, and it's so influential that oftentimes, then the more I grow in my walk with Christ, I take the way of escape. Sometimes I still fall, I choose to fall into temptation and sin. And, uh, and so it's definitely not a deterministic influence at that. Right. Right. Because we still sin as Christians, regenerate Christians still sin, but gosh, that's why I bring up, you know, I like to say the Calvinist who cheats on his wife. Otherwise we got to say that God determined the Calvinist to commit adultery and destroy his marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the Calvinist's wife shouldn't, be mad at her husband if she's consistent, if she's a Calvinist too, right? She should, yeah. she, she should feel sorry for her poor husband who was a victim and determined to cheat on her. 
she should be mad at God. So this gets us into the problem of evil really quickly. Yeah. Um, so we cannot right. uh, affirm a position that God creates antecedent conditions, which are uh, sufficient to necessitate all the Christian sin. Mm -hmm. Just right. a horrible view. So right. let me ask this though, Tim, but so let me play devil's advocate for just a second. So, <laughs> but wouldn't Molinism or, or the Molinists say, right, God didn't causally determine the rapist to sin or the, mm -hmm. the, the Christian to cheat on his wife, but God did put him in that position knowing that he would do that. It, yeah, and I, I don't it, even like that, uh, that character, okay. that characteristic or character. I don't, uh, yeah. I don't want to yeah, call it a yeah. Maybe it's a char yeah, yeah. characterization. Um, it's uh, a in fact, man. I've got an <laughs> article. I've got an article called Dr. Strange, Dr. Swenson, and Dr. Stratton, where okay. I talk about some of this stuff and even in the footnotes. But it's yeah, it uh, I, I don't think it's right to say that God puts us all in yeah. different situations. I think that's just a misunderstanding of what Craig says. Uh, okay, because yeah. uh, how how he describes it can give off that impression. Okay. Yeah, that's instead I, of looking at it as a whole, you know, yeah. as as you know, God decreeing what what would in happen. a sense he does right in a God sense, the world, yeah. In which but he knew think of it like, yeah, I see yeah. exactly what you're saying, yeah. and it's and not like this, that. Yeah, right. And I think this gets into uh, even one's view of the soul, whether you're a special creationist of the soul or a hold the tradition uh view of the soul i'm a i think traditionism makes more sense um but yeah if one was a special creationist that god creates each soul ex nihilo maybe you know and places each soul and each body and each you know i don't think it works that way yeah. um but god created a world i believe in which he knew that uh you know, my great, 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 great grandparents would meet and ultimately my great, great grandparents would meet. Ultimately, my parents would meet yeah, yeah. and that Tim Stratton would be born in Omaha, Nebraska in 1973. Yeah. So uh, so did God place me in this circumstance? Uh, I don't think it, I mean, in, in a sense, God created a world in which he knew that Tim Stratton would be born in Omaha, Nebraska in 1973. So in that sense, he actualized it. In that sense, he actualized yeah. it, but he didn't. Right. Put me in there like a chess piece. Or there, something. This is where the the unfallible barometer comes in. Infallible the barometer. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Infallible. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, yeah. Okay. So Tyler, with that in mind, rephrase your question for me. Let me see if I'm answering it here. No, I I think you are because that I and, and if I mischaracterize it, I apologize. I was going oh, off of everybody does it. Even PhD yeah. <laughs> philosophers mischaracterize it. Well, I thought White had had mentioned it like that, you know, oh, in yeah, the debate that you guys had did that, you know, mm -hmm. well, his, his big objection, since we're on objections, right, was that, well, the Molinist doesn't have a really a leg to stand on because they're saying at the same time, God still predestined that to happen. Yeah. So in that sense, God's still blameworthy is the way I took it anyway. Yeah, it's the me, same uh, thing, you know. It's the same right, thing. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. Um, They're just, the Calvinist is just adding the mechanisms that the Molinist doesn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay. So, again, okay. So, since you brought up the white debate, we got to bring up um, the controversial illustration um, or, that I brought up. <laughs> We're all <laughs> about controversy here, bro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, the Avengers, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Infinity yep. War and Endgame. Thanos. I bet you yeah. never heard the end of that. No, you know what? I'm like, oh, you want to make a big deal about that? I'm going to double down and use it all the more. Uh, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. Because I think it's a real... It, it, look, he was like trying to distract me as I was trying to explain it. I, I'm, see, I'm mm -hmm. trying to explain, look at the audience, look at him. And while I'm looking right. at him, he's talking to the audience, waving a Bible around. I'm like... I, it's so hard to even uh, keep focused, but yeah. So I don't think I explained it as well as I could have during the debate, sure. but I've written a lot about it on my website and, and talked about it on my YouTube channel quite a bit. I think it's a really good analogy. So Dr. Strange didn't place Thanos um, next to the Avengers, um, <laughs> their, their compound, right? He didn't place him there, but he created right. a, 
world in which he knew that Thanos would freely choose to go there. Um, uh, Doctor Strange didn't place uh, Natasha Romanoff, you know, Black Widow, in the scenario in which she would die. Spoiler alert. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he didn't we'll place the them there. Doctor Doctor Str Strange didn't place Tony Stark in the position to ultimately give his snap. You know, he didn't place them there. All he did was he knew everything that would happen if he gave Thanos the time stone, uh, right. did the unthinkable and gave him that stone, right? Everybody's like, what are you thinking? Even Tony Stark at the time was like, why? Why did you do it? And, and uh, Dr. Strange was like, it was the only way. And then he dies, right? But he was resurrected along with all the saints. So Strange created a world in which he knew he would die, that he would be resurrected, and that all the saints would be resurrected and crush mm. evil underneath their feet. Uh, I mean, they totally stole from scripture and had Molinism yeah. in mind at the same time. Uh -huh. And this was, and, and Dr. Strange was his character, um, at least at that time, the last movie, no, not so much, but uh, that multiverse of madness, that was a different director. But uh, the guy that developed Dr. Strange's character initially was a Biola graduate who had William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland and knew all about oh, wow. middle knowledge and libertarian freedom and how to solve the problem of evil. Uh, I did not Scott know that. Derrickson. Yeah, Scott Derrickson was his name. Philosophy and theology grad student. Nice. Fantastic. Um, yeah, right? And so wow. uh, you, you, I, I tell people, watch Endgame or watch Infinity War and Endgame with scripture in mind. Um, especially when you see uh, Doctor Strange. I mean, he gave him the power of middle knowledge to save the universe. Yeah. <laughs> the superpower of middle yeah. knowledge to save the universe. And, and so... He knew what he was getting himself into, and he didn't have to manipulate or place people in situations. All he did was give Thanos the time stone, and that actualized uh, a world of free creatures in which Doctor Strange knew how they would freely choose. And that was a world in which evil was ultimately defeated, and all the saints were raised, and you know everybody lives happily ever after yeah. they should have ended no. the story there but now they have to so <laughs> i just well i Let's, just thought of something real, just real quick david i yeah. i just thought of something and do you think that because let me let me just pick your guys' brains real quick so there's some sense in which if i let my daughter play in the street i know what's going to happen eventually right i might mm -hmm. not know details but let me ask you this. Do you guys think middle knowledge in lesser degrees, I'm not talking about how God has middle knowledge, obviously, but we hear in systematic theology this talk of communicable attributes. And I'm wondering, do you think middle knowledge, in a sense, is a communicable attribute that God has given us? Mm. Counterfactual mm. knowledge is. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Um. And so, I mean, the FBI makes a living based on counterfactual knowledge. Uh, football coaches make a living um, with counter counterfactual knowledge. We use right. it every day uh, when we're making judgments about when to pull out into traffic. Uh, right. So, yes, it's a it's a supernatural um, attribute, right? And because we are created in the likeness, in the image and likeness of God, uh, we have lesser degrees of His powers. And his attributes, right. which is really cool when we think about it. Exactly. Um, but we do have we do have superpowers, supernatural powers, right? We might not. I mean, we're so used to them, we don't think it's a big deal. The mere fact that I can <laughs> wave my right hand to you right now, look, my mind, really? right? I can move matter. This is kind of it's miraculous, right? Yeah. I'm an I, I can choose to move matter, which left to its own devices. Um, can't move. I, I, I am, I am uh, choosing to, um, to move matter. I don't know how it works. Right. Uh, I don't, uh -huh. uh, exhaustively. Um, but yeah, th so I, there's, there's supernatural powers we have, especially when it comes to rationality and aesthetics, you know, creating beauty. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, I think even this counterfactual knowledge, uh, it's not middle knowledge because we're not now, Dr. Strange technically had a weak form of middle knowledge because he actualized a world based upon millions and millions of possible options that he could have 
uh, chosen. And he actu actualized a specific, it's not ultimate metal knowledge because Dr. Strange himself is a contingent created being. Um, the, yeah, the, there's an ultimate uh, mega maximally great middle knowledge, if you will, that only God can have. Uh, yeah. Dr. Strange is one of the few examples I've found that we can say, yeah, that is a form of middle knowledge, at least weak middle knowledge. But we, uh, we do have counterfactual knowledge. I guess here's one. Mm -hmm. No, that, I don't know if that'll work. I'm not going to go. There. Hey, hey, um, Tim, Tim, yeah. would this would this work as a as a human yeah. being having weak counterfactual knowledge? Uh, somebody that's a master chess player. They know exactly what move. Like when you make that yeah, move, that'd be weak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the FBI. Oh, they, that's they Queen's know. Gambit. <laughs> right, this right, is right. Exactly how everything's going to yeah. play out. Yeah, yeah I would call right. that weak. It's it's yeah. it's counter. It's not perfect counterfactual knowledge because we're not saying they sure. know it with one hundred percent certainty, but it's yeah. uh, but it is counterfactual knowledge. And so when the FBI sets up the sting operation to catch the pedophile, yep, um, they know they know somebody so well. They've done their homework. They've studied them. They've watched them. They've scouted them. They know with extremely high degrees of certainty that if they set him in a um, get him in a certain circumstance that he mm -hmm. will, um, try to, uh, molest the child or, 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 yeah. or at least, uh, or something along those lines. Um, and then they stop it from happening before it actually happens. But when they've done enough that they can take it to the court and say, look, he was on his way to do it. And, uh, and they get convicted and rightly so. Um, and the football coach, like I said, just like the, the the chess player, but the football coach thinks, all right, um, they're on the, the goal line and they've been stopped three times. They got one more shot and the coach draws up the the play where he's going to fake everybody out. Um, he said he doesn't know for sure they're going to faked out, but based sure. on his knowledge, he knows that this is probably going to win the, the football game for him. So, um, yeah, we have weak, we have limited um, because we're in God's uh, image and likeness, we have this counterfactual knowledge that's, that's not perfect, but it's still pretty amazing when you think about it. it is, I believe it is yeah. a supernatural gift and that um, every yeah. time that we make a, a free choice in a libertarian sense, and especially when we, we act on it and when we act on our libertarian free choice and libertarian free thinking, and we mm -hmm. act on it to change something physical in the world, uh, we've done a mini miracle at that point. Um, so yeah. people say that miracles no longer occur. I'm like, mm. <laughs> every time you freely choose to think and act on it, you've at least done a mini miracle. Yeah. Um, that's the way I see it. Some people might not every like time. how I uh, describe that or label those things, but yeah. well, I recall hearing time. Dr. Flowers talk about uh, the, the police sting operation as a, as a support for, for free will and the, the idea that, you know, like like freedom not being a violation of god's omniscience mm -hmm. and looking at it as a problem to say okay well like if the like you said if the fbi can let's say intuit that you know based on this behavioral pattern that if i set up situation a you'll react in this way if i set up situation b you'll react in this way they're working with probability obviously and not perfect yeah. knowledge but even still if the if the fbi can pull that off how much more God should be able to pull right, that right. off? Right. Yeah. If the FBI has 90 percent certainty that the bad right. guy will take the bait, are we going to say that God doesn't? I mean, it would be arbitrary to say it's anything <laughs> less than a hundred for God. We're going to say that the FBI. I mean, we might say that the FBI even has. Some people might say, well, they know they know with ninety nine percent certainty he's going to do it. Okay. Well, God is. Perfect in knowledge, that's a but he knows being. with 100% certainty. And that doesn't mean right. that, therefore, that the antecedent conditions were sufficient to necessitate that sin, right? Mm -hmm. They were not right. causally determined to sin. Were they influenced? You better believe it. But they weren't determined. And that's why, I mean, look, if they were determined by the FBI uh, to commit the, the crime, then they mm -hmm. shouldn't go to jail. Yeah, they can't be convicted. No, the FBI should go to jail, right? right. <laughs> um, but if <laughs> but if they were merely influenced and they always had a way of escape, 
then they had libertarian freedom. And therefore, if they if they chose to sin, they deserve to go to jail. Can the I ask one more thing my, before we because I, I yeah. feel like we're about to wind down and shut this off. I, 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 I want to ask one more thing because it's relevant to what you just said. I'm right, thinking yeah. about the constant and incessant appeal to the greatest desire according to your nature is the nature mm-hmm. of a person. You're you're relegating that directly into the influence pile, right? You're not saying that a person because a person's nature can, let's say, limit the amount of choices that might be present. But it is in no way a causal relation between my nature and my choosing. Right. Yeah, at least sometimes, like I said, when I go um, to the restaurant and I look at the menu, it might be Mm -hmm. the case that tacos are my greatest desire at that moment. (laughs) And uh, therefore, uh, since my greatest desire is based on my taste buds, which is based on my DNA, which none of that is up to me, I can see a causal chain um, that determines me ordering tacos at that moment. But that's not something I should be praised or blamed for. Uh, right. Now, now I'm not saying that I don't have libertarian freedom there. I'm just granting to the sake of well, the well, Edwardian. Yeah, yeah. Well, in terms of moral yeah. decision making, though. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so moral. Morally, I think we can choose against our greatest desire. Mm. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, so at least our greatest physical desire. Uh, okay. And, okay. and we can just do what's right. We can do the rational thing um, even when it's not our greatest desire. And that's what separates us from the animals, right? Animals mm. react to their greatest desire all the time, but we're rational agents and we can, we can say, I ought not do what is, or what I desire the most to do. Um, now with and, that said, and, and, Hey, and, and, yeah. And the consequent of that can be dire. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Now this is especially true. And I talk about this in my book especially true when it comes to rationality. If we always choose based on our greatest desires, then ultimately uh, we can't trust our beliefs because that mean, means we've ultimately chosen all of our beliefs based upon our greatest subjective desires. And that's not reason right. to believe anything. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's what the woke mob will tell us today that we ought to just act <laughs> on our desires. But if you're a Christian, you ought to oppose their uh, irrationality. Um, and and oppose wokeness. And so we don't, I mean, we, to say that we always choose what we believe based upon our greatest desires. And then even when we evaluate our beliefs, our evaluations are still determined by our greatest desires. That's a horrible reason to believe anything. Everything would be wishful thinking at that point. Right. I'm really right. glad you, I'm really glad you guys went here. And so in winding down, I really, really want to touch on Romans 8, 7, or really Romans 8, 5. Let me read it real quick uh, for those who don't know and to refresh all of our memories. For those living according to the flesh, and I love the way the NET translates this, right? Because the uh, the Greek is phrenusin, right? And it means to set your mind on. And, and they set their mind on uh, with the usin right there. But for those living according to the flesh, have their outlook or their mindset shaped by the things of the flesh. But those who live according to their spirit have their outlook shaped by the things of the spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace because the mindset of the flesh is hostile to, to God, for it does not submit to the law of God nor is it able to do so, to do so those who are in the flesh cannot please god you however are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of god lives in you and he goes mm-hmm. on to say you know now if anyone does not have the spirit of christ this person does not belong to him but if christ is in you your body is dead because of sin but the spirit is your life because of righteousness and i love it right mm-hmm. it's a beautiful Amen. promise but, but but to go back to that that frenusen right Freneo, to and and Tim, I think this ties in to what you said about rationality. Clear. So these people, they're not basing these choices off their greatest desire in any way. This is their belief. This is their mindset, right? And so, how does that parallel with the libertarian concept of free will? I mean, the Bible is clear, and I think this is one of those Calvinist objections 
where e either I'm misunderstanding it or I think it really, really holds a lot of weight uh, to an objection uh, against libertarian free will, but they're not able to do the law of God, right? They're not able to do these things that please God. What's your response uh, to to that objection? So unregenerate Christians aren't able? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and they, so uh, think of it this way. Mm -hmm. I just had, I was just in Utah a few weeks ago and uh, had a conversation with a Mormon about this, but um, because they, because this gets us into good works and things like that. And right. I said, okay, imagine there was a guy who hated God, just hated him, but decided to stick it to the man, so to speak, and decided to stick it to God and live perfectly keep the law perfectly and 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 even became a pastor and and preached the true gospel mm -hmm. and and led thousands of people to Christ all while hating God is that person in heaven is that person saved no mm -hmm. not at all wow. because he hates God there's nobody in heaven who doesn't love Jesus and there's uh everybody in heaven loves Jesus uh, and there's nobody in hell who loves Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody in hell who loves God. So um, keeping the law, so, so let's just get back to an unregenerate person, somebody who's not a Christian. He can do all the good things in the world, uh, doesn't do anything for him unless he's in a love relationship with God. That's what ultimately transforms you. Um, I, I like to say that the essence of salvation in one word is love a love relationship with your creator. And Jesus says, if you love me, you, you follow my command, you know? Uh, and, and so you can tell, you can judge somebody's by their fruit, even if they're in that love relationship. And then if you don't see this fruit, some red flags are raised and you need to, you know, evaluate your life. And, and, right. and other, this is why other uh, believers come, come up next to this person and say, Hey, you should evaluate your life. I'm not the judge. I'm just, <laughs> not seeing fruit here, you know, <laughs> right. um, I had somebody do that to me and he was the guy that invited me to that DC talk concert. Um, you know, so, okay. Praise maybe I'm going off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I'm going off on a rabbit trail here. Uh, my point is, uh, yeah, the, the, the unregenerate can't do good works, uh, and will follow their sinful desires. Um, you know, or, I mean, basically, apart from, you know, the, the I, I believe, so I'm a substance dualist, and I think this is a really good way to understand this. I mean, you you, you let me just move according to my, uh, <laughs> my, my flesh, and you take out the, the soul and the image of God, and I'm a, I'm an animal. I mean, <laughs> in some sense, and that's what, you know, I think it was Aristotle that referred to us as rational animals. That's what the right. human is, right? So you take the rational out of there, and I'm just a, just an animal, <laughs> and uh, and and of course I will behave like an animal, right? So unregenerate Christians, yes, they still have a soul created in the image of God, but the unregenerate whose soul hasn't been uh, transformed, whose soul uh, does not have an understanding of objective truth and right and wrong, and and Right. You know, in, in reality, uh, it's not uncommon for them to live like animals, but they also don't have to. I mean, Hitler, uh, I'll, I'll say this, Hitler, um, an unregenerate um, person, might not have had the, uh, the ability, the opportunity to exercise an ability to choose something good, but he didn't have to kill six million Jews. Right. right now, if somebody wanted to disagree, if the Calvinist wants to disagree, then they're left with saying that God causally determined him to kill six million Jews. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. even though Hitler couldn't become a Christian, um, we could say that Christian could that Hitler could not become a Christian or could not choose Christianity. He did have libertarian freedom to not kill six million Jews, but he did it anyway. And that's why he's blameworthy and why we why he's probably the most hated person on the that ever walked the earth <laughs> you sure. know well i some, can agree with that <laughs> yeah some people might say it's jesus <laughs> so then, <laughs> so then that, that moral freedom i guess like because this yeah. is the and i've i've thought about exactly what you just that example that's a great example yeah. 
Okay. And this is this is how I would explain it to somebody who's like completely lame and has never encountered these conversations before. If they ask me, what does free will account or amount to? Right. It would be something like the reason why we blame Hitler and not a Holocaust for the same volume of death. Right. Mm, the, ho- the, yeah. the 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 hurricane uh, is mm. is something that 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 can't have a willful decision over how many people it causes harm to, but Hitler had a willful decision in causing a Holocaust. Right. And so you blame Hitler for a Holocaust, but you don't blame a hurricane for a Holocaust. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's a great uh, illustration. I'm going to have to steal that from you, Josh. (laughs) Go ahead, man. Right on. Well, guys, you know, we're, we're like two over two hours in. Yeah. We're, Uh, and we only got through half the questions, so Man, we're gonna we have to we're gonna have to wind it down part here. Two. And yes, and we would love to have you on for part two. But before you, before we we do close here, can you yeah. just uh, tell us where to find you? Please promote mm-hmm. your book, show it to <laughs> the audience again, and you know, you know, prop yeah. yourself up a little bit. All we, right, we love we we're all about our guests on Faith Unaltered. Yeah. You know, so well, plug you. away. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'll never miss an opportunity uh, for self promotion. But um, <laughs> yeah, human freedom, divine knowledge, and mere Molinism. Um, uh, there's, I, I think it's a pretty good book. There's some things that I'm changing, some things that I'm making stronger. Uh, the, uh, for the second edition that will come out hopefully in 2023. Working on that right now, but this is still a really good book. You can get it on Amazon. The big ideas behind this book, I stand by all of them. And I uh, encourage you to get that. There's also a study guide that goes along with it. You can get that on Amazon too. I co-authored this with uh, Tim Fox, Timothy Fox. And, uh, and, and I don't, it's not just a study guide, but it goes further and uh, goes deeper into all the different um, chapters. And uh, I think there's some pretty cool stuff there. Um, you can follow my, uh, most of my written material is, uh, online at freethinkingministries.com got tons of videos on our youtube channel just uh, search for freethinking ministries um i've got uh two journal journal articles out in uh, perichoresis 16.2 got another one coming out in in the perichoresis journal it's supposed to come out this month uh, but they got a different editor so it's been pushed back a few months so it'll be out um shortly and then i've got another journal article that's forthcoming uh, i think i know who's publishing it uh but we're not 100 percent sure yet but you're not going to nice. want to miss this one i just actually put the finishing touches on it just a couple hours before we started um this nice. uh, talk tonight and so uh really excited about that i'm co-authoring that with uh one of the top thinkers uh in my opinion to ever walk the planet um and he's well known and respected and a, and a leader in this field and we're defending um the free thinking argument which has been under a lot of fire recently uh there's a lot of atheists naturalists that hate it a lot of calvinists that hate it there's even a handful of libertarians and even a couple molinists who don't like it um oh, wow. and this guy is uh coming alongside me and saying you guys uh this is a good argument and let me tell you why so uh, really looking forward um, to publishing that article soon. And, it, and it's not just him that's co-authoring it. It's been reviewed by other philosophers and epistemologists. Uh, nice. So a lot of this gets into epistemology. And uh, so I'll be even discussing internalism and externalism and, and all these things there. So can't we'll wait for that. We'll have to have you on to re- whenever you release that. We'll have to have you on to interview about that too. That'd be yeah, fun. I can't wait. Yeah. All right. So Tyler, what do we got next, man? Oh man, David. So David has taken the the reins and really has came out on top. I'm so proud of this guy for getting the guests that we've got on. We have got Dr. Hugh Ross coming on to talk science to talk about his book Matter a Matter of Days, and we also have IP himself, Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy, is going to talk uh, to come on uh, Faith Unaltered. To talk, what is uh, David? Give our give our listeners a little, just a little, about what Mike's going to come on to talk with us about. Well, mainly what we're going to be doing is going over. See, I made a list of a, a lot of 
lot of objections that these like the top objections that Christians are having or are facing or why people are leaving the church. I kind of combined them all together. And uh, I wanted to start off with a, a show since we started doing this old earth, young earth thing. Let's get the science, right? So I, uh, the one I, I proposed to uh, Michael is how can uh, I trust in something that's not scientifically proven? And so we will be discussing things that evolve around that. I love it. I love it. We've got, around. that's a, <laughs> that's a, evolution might be a topic that we might talk about. Yeah, we are. Future. <laughs> Unintended. <laughs> right. But, yeah. but Dr. Stratton, thank you so much for, for joining us, coming on to talk, you know, diving deeper into Molinism. Do you think we went deeper than your, uh, in, I know a lot of your intros you know, it revolved around, you know, an intro to Molinism. Do you think we went deeper in this episode than some of your other episodes? Uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed okay. uh, the fact that we got into the historical stuff a little bit. Yeah. Talked about the grounding objection, talked about uh, a lot of things. So, um, yeah, let's do it again and go even deeper. Let's do it. Let's do it. Thank God for no technical difficulties. Yes. My brother Joshua Davison, thank you, do so much. You got something coming up on CSG here in a minute, don't you? Yeah, From Saturday. Plug, I'm going to be talking to our buddy. Uh, be talking to our buddy Chase Orozco. He's uh, uh, authoring a trilogy, which is a fantasy novel, and uh, I want to talk to him about how he incorporates the faith and the biblical wisdom that he knows into the characters and the uh, story building that he has. And so I'm really excited to talk about that. Um, but if I can, I really want to encourage you, Dr. Stratton, in uh, you were name dropping some of the, the big name apologists that you were interested in when you first got into this. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that you're that person to somebody. And if that can make you that much more excited for what you do, amen, bro, because you do a great job. Hmm. Well, that, that warms my heart. And thank you for that encouragement, Josh. You're welcome. Uh, you know, there's... When you get into this business, uh, you, you, you know, you get some haters <laughs> and uh, you really do. I mean, you that got haters that surround you, even yep. fellow Christians <laughs> that seem to hate you and despise you um, and claim to do it all in love. And, you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> yep. you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's sometimes you need to hear some encouragement. So thank you. That's it right. was worth, you know, I'm really pleased to be been able to talk to you. This is a long time coming and I'm, I'm, I feel very privileged to be in the room. Right. Even digitally. Well, let's do it again. Uh, the pleasure yeah, is mine. You know, we're all you. fans, like I said, man. So with that, we are out of here, guys. Tyler, shut us down with your quip, sir. We, we will definitely see you all next time again. A big thanks to Dr. Stratton. Check out more Faith Unaltered content over at our Facebook page, YouTube channel and podcast uh, fireside.fm is where you can find us but until next time good night god bless and stay like christ